to our drawing room, I think we'll call it today, and welcome to our weekly Political Geek Fest, where we have a pour over the weekly Guardian Essential Report. Um, and it's great to have my partner in crime, Catherine Murphy, with us, and we'll get talking in a sec. But before we start, as we do every day, just pay our respects to traditional owners. We're all um, on Indigenous land. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation and wherever we are around the country we do so knowing that we are on land that was never ceded. Um, we pay our respects to Indigenous leaders, past, present and emerging. And today um, we also are going to have a look at some numbers that really sort of start talking about a bit of a recalibration in the way Australians are looking at politics. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting moment, isn't it, after about a month of lockdown and a debate going on about whether or not we should be ending this little staycation or staying a bit longer, um, our attitudes to government and to public institutions are also changing. And we're gonna go through some of those, those figures in just a minute. Before we get cracking though, a couple of ground rules. Um, the first one is kind of my get out of jail. We're still working this out as we go along. So if there's any technical glitches, bear with us. Um, although we're finding Zoom to be a fantastic technology where, as you can see, if you turn your gallery on, everyone's in this big room together and they're, they're sharing an hour of the day. And the idea of Australia at home is to have a bit of shared space to exchange ideas and think through some of the wicked problems that our leaders and people across civil society are having to think through. Um, the second thing is to use the chat, introduce yourself in the chat function on the right hand if you haven't been here before, um, and use that to ask questions. So this is a very much an interactive discussion. Um, we'll be having a chat, then we'll be moving into the, um, into the discussion room to, to get people's feedbacks and ask them to come up onto the stage as well. Um, finally, we're recording this for distribution later, so please keep things nice as I know you will. So um, let's get into it. Catherine, you are, I believe now, two thirds of your way through your quarter <laughs> of an essay, but it's, how, it's, are, how are you going this week? It's, uh, it's, it's nice that you're ambitious for me, Peter. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, welcome to another session. Yeah, look, I'm going okay. I'm really enjoying my project. I'm uh, putting a lot of words on the screen. Um, and, uh, and talking to a lot of people and trying to record a very interesting story. So it's, um, it's very interesting, uh, but how it all comes together is uh, still a bit of a work in progress. But anyway, we'll get there, I hope, I hope. How are you? I found the last week more challenging than previous weeks. I think I'd, I'd sort of describe the first few weeks of this as the first scene in Saving Private Ryan. Everyone's rushing to the beach, just trying to create a bit of a beachhead and somewhere to, to take shelter and now I think the reality of us all being here for a while is taking starting to take hold and there is frustrations no doubt about um, not being able to get up and move around our our society and, and and being stable so you know I think everyone's going in a bit of a wave at the moment though so yeah, mm. it's not all bad. Mm. Well I quite enjoy it. Yeah, I think I think once it's over, we're going to grieve the end of it as well. Like that idea that you've got to start going, if we do, start going back into work and start, you know, getting back and getting busy, busy. Yes, getting busy, busy. Well, I sort of feel plenty busy, but it's, uh, but it's nice to do it sort of outside my normal environment. And yeah. the thing I must say that I'm really enjoying, I don't know about others on the chat, um, but... Uh, because I'm working working at home uh, just at the moment, uh, the thing that's uh, really lovely in my neighbourhood, which is normally absolutely pin drop quiet because everyone goes to work for many, many hours a day and then comes home after dark, my neighbourhood is full of uh, kids roaming around, uh, people going for walks, uh, people out with their dogs. Uh, it's like, you know, I keep saying to my husband, it's kind of like, it feels like about 1978 uh, in our street uh, most days because there's just, uh, people are back, people are in their homes. Families are spending time together. Uh, you know, there may, there may be, some of that time might be gritted teeth time, let's be honest. Uh, but it's really interesting to see my own suburb 
sort of coming back to life in this really organic kind of way. So, yeah, and I think it's probably a discussion we'll have at some stage um, around the importance of community. We had a discussion about home and housing policy on yesterday, but the other idea that my wife pushes at me quite a bit is that if people are living their lives in their local neighbourhoods, they start valuing it, valuing it more. It's not just a dormitory to go off and do more important things. There's actually people that live their whole days, older people, people with young kids, people working from home. And I think when all of us experience being in our community for a longer period of time, it inevitably makes it value, us value it as more as well. Well, yeah, well, a couple of things are happening. We're spending more time in our community uh, because we there there are sort of restrictions, actual restrictions on who we can see and how long we can see them for and, and where we can interact with people. We're, we're basically sort of locked in with our, our families and talking to friends on platforms like this one. But I, I try and go for a walk once a day just to get out of my head. Uh, and I find all around the neighbourhood up in the bush near, my, near our place, people are stopping at an appropriately social distant, socially distant kind of uh, conversation point, but people are making a point of stopping. It's not just head down, I'm doing my exercise, I'm powering through, you know, not connecting with other humans. Like, it's very interesting to me how people are stopping, strangers stopping, hi, how are you, how are you going, beautiful day, how are you managing? just behavior that I've not seen before. And it's because everybody's trying to maintain normal human connections in an extraordinary mm. time. And uh, look, I'm not saying, isn't it great? We've got a pandemic. It's obviously horrendous. Um, and the consequences of this will, uh, well, it will reset our society for years to come. And, uh, and I'm, I it's yet to be determined whether that's in a positive way or in a negative way. But I tell you what, there's some really interesting behavioural things that are happening all around us uh, and, uh, and mostly from my current vantage point, positive. Yeah, a sense of shared journey, I think. Um, and there is, a, there is actually an anchor point, a, a shared experience and a shared experience. disruption exactly. that we're going through. And yeah. Yes, all the neighbourhood, everyone's neighbourhood, I think, feels a slightly friendlier place. And that goodwill is actually, you know, we spoke a little bit about happiness last week. I'm going to move into some of the findings from this report now, but I guess that sort of, you know, in, in the face of a terrible pandemic, the kind of good vibes in Australia, I think, is, is, is kind of the defining story at the moment. Whether that lasts or not, who knows? I'm just doing my awkward little share here and hopefully get the shortcut that makes it work a little bit quicker for everyone. Um, so I thought today we would start, have I got that on slideshow guys? Yep. Yes, lovely. Um, the response, the, the, the support or the approval of the government response continues to rise. It's up to 65% of people saying very good or quite good. So the dark line is the most recent report. I, one of the things I feel is that people are starting to think government isn't necessarily a partisan term at the moment. Catherine, I don't know if that's something that you've reflected on. Um, we spoke a few weeks ago about how Scott Morrison as leader's approval rating has gone up, but the, it is really a product of people being um, approving of the way the government's been going about its business. Yeah, well, it's, it, and not to detract from the government's or, or the community approval of the government because it, it, you know, it's there. I'm not trying to suggest it isn't there, but I just think the concept of government is slightly more broad than uh, what what we would what we would normally be tracking through this survey. We've made the point here, I think, Peter, before that Morrison, in fact, is fronting the decisions of nine governments, not just his own. Uh, and so there is, uh, there is that kind of sense that, uh, the, that the Federation is managing this crisis, not just the government in Canberra. And we obviously measure in this survey the approval for state governments as well as the federal governments. I don't know if we'll get get onto that specifically, but I'm just I'm just referencing that. There's government is a broader concept than what we would normally report about or talk about. 
And the other thing is that there are many, many institutional responses sitting underneath this as well. Uh, you know, the union movement has rallied, the business community has rallied. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's multi-dimensional. And I think, you know, when we get into the trust measures, presumably mm. later on in the conversation, we can see that when we sort of specify how do you feel about this element of your society, you can see that sort of uh, rebound or rebirth of hope among voters that, uh, that we live in a functional society rather than, a, than in a failed state. And mm. I think some of um, the government is obviously working extremely hard, um, trying to bring as much competence to bear as it possibly can in relation to this crisis, although you can quibble with all kinds of stuff. But I think also part of this uh, is that we, uh, we are sort of showing up favourably compared to countries that we would normally compare ourselves with. Uh, things are obviously completely out of control in Britain. And, you know, just before we came on the call today, you know, Donald Trump has said he's going to apparently end all immigration. I mean, things in America are absolutely melting down. Um, and so... Those our- morning briefings are crazy to well, watch. Guardian's streaming them live and it's kind of become a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine, but they're just... Well, it's just, in, it's just insane. It's insane. And so I think just, just to sum up, I think we're sort of... There's, there's this broader concept of government that we're looking at right at the moment and also uh, we're comparing ourselves favourably to uh, other responses that we can see in other jurisdictions, I reckon. Yeah, and that comes through in some of the pull-out quotes that the guys have put into the presentation, which are from the um, the focus groups, the online focus groups we're running parallel to this research. And definitely, I think, um, having, you know, nations like the United States and UK that are so culturally um, similar with such a different story about how they're dealing um, with the virus mm. actually sort of reinforces Team Australia, as Scotty likes to call it. Mm. In terms of Team Australia, I think this next graph is really interesting as well in that this is not yet sure coalition voters are more supportive, but look at the Labor voters there. That's um, 55% Mm, support for a um, Prime Minister or a government they're conditioned to oppose. Yeah. Um, And even amongst Greens, 52%. Yeah, well, it's sort of interesting that, and, and it's, a, it's a heartening measure in a way, uh, because I must say for the last few years in particular, I've sort of started to wonder whether, um, uh, whether, uh, whether things are so tribal in our kind of public square, whether people can see beyond the, their own partisan loyalties in terms of how they're consuming information. I don't mean that in a patronising way at all. I, I just mean... Uh, Often we see in the poll, Peter, that people refract their, uh, how they feel about issues through their partisan loyalties, right? Whereas here, um, obviously, there is an element of partisan loyalty uh, in terms of the response, for sure. But also, voters are judging on merit. Uh, and they're, they're prepared to give uh, credit where, where they think credit is due. And that's a healthy thing too. You know, I don't want to sound too poly, Pollyanna-ish throughout this conversation, but I strangely am looking on the bright side on a number of fronts today. But I think that's actually, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And of course, the dividend from this is, as we were saying a bit earlier, this trust. Um, so trust has been a measure that we've run for over a decade. Um, Trust in most public institutions took a real dive about the same time as the Rudd government collapsed. A um, couple of things happening at once. I think back then it was the climate wars. It was the propensity of political parties to take down their leaders. And it was also part of a global trend that was anti-institution. Um, now, they've been, for, for a lot of these organisations, particularly the parliaments, um, they've been really low for a really long period of time. And there's been double digit increases in the number of people that say they have a lot or some trust. So, you know, this is the first time in a decade that you've got state parliaments, federal parliaments and local councils all with 50% plus trust. So if we said our public square has been broken, there is 
a sense that maybe there's a bit of a rebuild going on here? Yeah, well, I think this, these figures are really fascinating. For me, they're, they're the, sort of the most interesting element of this week's survey. Um, and it does demonstrate, uh, you know, sort of putting, putting the story of the last few slides together, that uh, people haven't entirely given up on, on government and institutions, that maybe experts have had a bit of a rebound, you know, that, that, that sort of... Uh, declining trust phenomenon that you were just outlining, Peter, that sort of started around the Rudd era. Um, you know, we, we sort of associate that with the Rudd era because obviously that a sort of chaos entered our politics at that point and, and, and you know, has persisted for more than a decade. But that, that period in time was also the global financial crisis. Uh, and that, that event, that external economic shock kind of redrew the boundaries of politics in many, many countries and also redrew the relationships between people and institutions. Uh, through that crisis, people started to look at government, they started to look at, at corporations, they started to look at regulations and concluded that systems were not working for them. They were not working for ordinary people. And so we've, we've been on this long slide of trust and the sort of cycle of alienation, disengagement, disillusionment has kind of fed itself and has kind of been a feedback loop back into politics. And we see in this instance, uh, we see that uh, people are daring to hope that we, that we might be turning a corner here now, which sort of <laughs> suggests to me that uh, for political parties, for political actors, um, there is a big premium at the moment uh, if you just decline to be a dickhead, if you, if you just basically <laughs> do what, what people hope and trust you ought to do as a government. I'm very, very hopeful that political parties are, are listening to this mm -hmm. and are absorbing this because, uh, you know, it's, it's way too soon to say <laughs> whether or not uh, the level of... Uh, or, or the cessation of rancour in our public space, the, the sort of dialing down of partisanship, the return of experts, the return of competence. It's way too soon to say whether or not that's now, you know, going to reassert itself as a permanent feature of our system. Mm. So it, it feels like decline to be a dickhead should be some j long German word. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know what it would be, but anyway, yeah, please decline to be let's a come up. Let, let, let's come up for air for a minute. Um, the, the other question I had for you sort of around the politics of this week was that um, I guess if the assumption that we are, we are seeing a rebuilding in trust, if you were to look at um, the last vestiges of distrust, you'd be reading Malcolm Turnbull's mm. book. Yes. What yes. are your reflections of, like, and you can't blame Turnbull for the timing of the book, but I think it does jar, doesn't it, to well, be oh, well, sort of I, going over what seems really petty personal stuff at a time like this. I'm interested in your reflections. Yeah, well, he's sort of uh, the, the memoir, if, if, you, if you grab it and read it, is I think it's, it's, it's like a whopping five or 600 pages. It's, um, it is uh, all the reporting is obviously focused very intensively on the soap opera of the leadership struggles. Uh, and there's a lot of that in the memoir, but there's, there's a lot of other stuff too. Um, and yeah, look, the, the most stressful thing, and I, I, I read it uh, last, last week and uh, had to prepare a piece on it for The Guardian, and I'm doing a conversation with Turnbull later this week um, about it. Uh, the most stressful thing I found about reading the memoir was it took me back to a, a time in politics which was just horrendous, just absolutely horrendous. And uh, it, he, he lays it all out. Well, it's, it's, it's basically he kind of chronicles the horrendous decade through his own vantage point. And, uh, and I found, even though I lived through it and I wasn't surprised by any of it because I was actually there, I found it personally really stressful and difficult. It was sort of like why, I, I was struggling with it. Why, <laughs> why, am, why are you taking me back here? Why have I got to relive this crap, you know, this kind of brutal, banal, hideous crap. Um, 
but anyway, it's it's obviously sort of cathartic for him, and it's a it's a it's an important part of our history and all of that sort of stuff. But I think I'll, I'll be interested if others read it uh, on the chat. I'll be interested in whether or not other people have those sentiments, or whether I'm just sort of suffering from PTSD because I was obviously very close to it and had to report on it through all that period and mm. struggled with it mightily in my own reporting and commentary because it, it, there was sort of so much failure in that period. So it's interesting to juxtapose Turnbull thrusting us all back into that period with us collectively, as we see through the survey, feeling a bit better about politics and about our public institutions. And you're right, the, the two do jar, that's for sure. Just you know, sliding doors. If Turnbull was running the show now, do you think we'd be, it would be any different to how it's going now? Or is it just the system's locked in? I've, I have, no, 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 I've played this mind game, actually. Strangely, it's sort of part of the essay. I don't think it'll feature in the essay, but I just did it as a, as a like mental gymnastics. Would, would things be any different? Uh, with with a different front person. Uh, I think things would be different, actually, with different front people. Um, I think you, you could look at Turnbull. Um, uh, I think you could probably reach the conclusion based on his past uh, sort of predispositions that perhaps the stimulus may not be as large as Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg have, have presided over. Um, uh, possibly, it's hard to say this is a different event to the global financial crisis, but I think there would be differences. Uh, if Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister, that's a fun thought exercise. Um, one of his colleagues said to me when I was doing this mental gymnastics with another person in the Liberal Party, they said, well, Tony would have had tanks on the streets by now, which is a fun <laughs> thought. Um, anyway, uh, so there's, you think about what Tony might have done. And then you can also think about what a Labor government would have done and whether or not that would be similar or different to what this government's doing. And that's, that's a really interesting thought, I reckon. Well, expand that one more line. All right. What, would, what, what do you think a Labor government would be doing right now? That's well, I think, I think the sort of, I think the stimulus would be similar, but I think uh, we would see, uh, because one of the sort of really interesting bits about this story, about the government's response, we've sort of focused on who has been supported by the government's response. We haven't much focused on who is not being supported throughout. And there's some interesting political judgments sort of embedded in that, which we can tease out a bit. Like, you know, the arts community, for example, has not been supported. The university sector would tell you very strenuously that it has not been supported through this crisis in the way that some other sectors have been. Obviously, you know, many casuals were left out of the JobKeeper payment. Uh, temporary workers were left out of the JobKeeper payment. Uh, I think if Labor had designed this stimulus, we would have seen more of those groups accommodated, perhaps, at, at a larger price tag, mm. which then you know, sort of uh, would have a whole other kind of set of narratives running about whether or not the stimulus is appropriate, whether it's too much. Uh, and, and of course, as a number of people are pointing out in the chat, the main difference may well have been that a coalition opposition would have been a lot more Trumpian and less likely to sort of swing in behind if the GFC was any indication. Well, see, this is an interesting thought. And that, yeah. would, depend, that would depend a little bit on leaders as well, I think. Um, that's an interesting thought exercise to give yourself. Would the coalition have backed it in the way that Albanese has or, or, or not? Would they have done that or not? Uh, and the other, you know, kind of can of worms to open if we, with this thought process is, what would the media coverage have been like mm. of a Labor, you know, if, 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 I don't know, who was, it was Bowen, of course, wasn't it? Bowen. If, if Bill Shorten had won the election and Bill Short, Shorten and Chris Bowen strode into the courtyard at the back of Parliament House and said, we're unveiling a wages subsidy that would have included more groups and therefore would have been even more expensive than $130 billion over six months what would the media reception for that have been like? Because, uh, and I suspect it would have been fundamentally different to, mm. uh, to the reception that has sort of met the government. So anyway, it's a fun little 
it's a fun little mental game. I mean, it's all speculation, but it's kind of fun. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to bring our King Geek, John Remington, into the discussion um, just to tell us what's going on in the chat, if there are any um, sort of specific themes coming up in, in, in questions. But also, before that, John, there was a, a query earlier on about our methodology and whether the lockdown has changed the way we do our research. Yeah. So um, we, our survey is done online, so 100% online. So in that sense, it hasn't changed too much from before the lockdown and before the pandemic. So people are still able to do our survey regardless of the physical isolation that's going on. Um, <clears throat> we've also tracked how people do the survey. So you can do it on your laptop, tablet, even mobile phones as well. And again, we track the proportion of people that we see completing it. And that's been relatively stable. A few people doing it at work, as you can imagine, but otherwise pretty consistent. Um, the main points through the chat were particularly earlier on about the comparisons between Australia and other countries and whether or not the US and the UK dominates those comparisons and therefore is it a fair, is that a fair comparison to judge the government and their actions on it? Great. Well, we're going to open it up to questions in a little while, but I might just jump back into another set of questions we asked, which I thought were really interesting this week, which was around the app. And the app has sort of been put forward as this magic thing that will allow us to get back to business. Um, we asked people their attitudes towards it. There's a little bit of a um, mea culpa here in that we, at, at the start, and John can explain this better, at the start of last week, it looked like it was going to be a tracking app that would actually collect um, people's um, locations. Um, the government is, as the Prime Minister is, I think, want to do, iterating the proposition as we go. But I think the findings are still quite interesting. Um, and we'll just sort of whiz them through them and maybe come back up and sort of see if people have got any specific comments or questions about the app. So. Um, in my other sort of civic interest, I'm, I also work with the Australia Institute Centre for Responsible Technology. So I'm, you know, my, my starting point is huge scepticism towards any sort of technology that's going to um, create further opportunities for our information to be collected and commercialised or used by, by the state. Um, that said, I was really interested in whether the general public shared those concerns. Um, and it's kind of a split. And again, the proposition we put forward is probably a little bit more extreme than what's now being put on the table. But um, with the idea of having your location monitored, we had 63% of people saying they'd be concerned, um, but a majority saying it would probably help limit the spread of the virus. We also had very low confidence the government would not misuse any data it collected. Um, but I thought the key one was 38% said they'd download the app anyway, which is pretty close to the minimum the government is saying it needs for a viable product. So I know those numbers open up massive cans of worms. Just I, I guess there's a number of different um, questions. One is, will it work? One is, what are the ground rules going to be? The third one is what sort of sunsets going to be put on the data. But I thought it was an interesting initial um, check on where people's heads are at, given that it seems to almost be being put forward as a condition precedent of getting things opening up again. So, Catherine, anything you'd like to reflect on yeah. any of those uh, well, numbers? Well, it's sort of that's sort of roughly where it would have, where I would have predicted, I suppose, if you'd asked me to put down 20 bucks on what, yeah. what, how people would respond on those various questions. That seems basically where I would think people would be at. Um, right to be suspicious, right to be civic minded. You know, this sort of, we're, we're all over the place with it and, and for obvious reasons, um, because it's sort of, um, we're, we're right to, um, you know, there's been so much consciousness raised over the privacy that we've all basically given up um, uh, to be, you know, to be residents of the digital world, right? We've given up just shed loads of privacy 
to uh, to Facebook and to to Google and to other platforms, uh, and uh, many of us have done that with even th without even thinking about it. Uh, there's been a rebound around that. People are now more conscious of what they've given away, uh, and there is, uh, and obviously we we're, we're correct to um, want to ask a lot of questions before handing over data to governments uh, because there's track records there too. But the fact of the matter is, I suppose the app. Um, uh, well, I suppose that what the government's trying to say is one: if we if we've got the app, it, it makes our contact tracing uh, work much more efficient because uh, we you can either collect this information off an app or you can collect it off a patient by sending them down for half an hour and and making them fill out an exhaustive checklist. So what they're trying to say is, oh, well, we'll get the information anyway. It's just more laborious to do it one way or the other, um, you know. And that's that that is probably true. But then uh, the critical thing with all of this in my head, though, is, um, and it goes beyond the app, right? There's, there's obviously the app. There are expanded police powers uh, through these public health declarations. Governments are using extraordinary powers right at the moment in order to manage this crisis. Um, I think we're right to be highly watchful and attentive about the use of those powers. And I think what we need to do journalistically on the other side of this is to make sure that those powers are wound back after this episode, because the problem with all of this is always mission creep. Once governments acquire information, they they don't like to give it up. Once police forces acquire new powers in order to police communities, they don't like giving that up. So we've got we've got a big task here as a society and journalism professionally too to try and be constructive in in these debates but also make sure that these these surveillance tools and these powers don't uh, are, are not in you know are not in our collective reality any longer than they need to be there, there's a there's a few different views coming through in the chat so i might just call people up for just 30 seconds so denise Shrabel had a perspective are you there denise i am but you don't want to see me right now i'm doing my ankle exercises hello oh <laughs> I'm doing my physio. Um, what did you want me to bring up? Oh, just around your attitude towards the app. I mean, I'm concerned about the app. Anyone who watches this government on a daily basis, like I do, as you and Catherine would both know, um, would, would rightly have concerns about the app. Um, I'm someone who actively speaks truth to power, who attends things like protests, who... Um, you know, puts my name to my views about any government, no matter what colour or what brand they are. Um, I'm concerned about what they might do. I think, um, you know, scope or um, it's a slippery slope. We've seen um, examples of the Australian Federal Police being used. Annika Smethurst is one example. Uh, Stephen Conroy's office was raided for the NBN uh, and so on. There are numerous examples of reasons that we should be incredibly concerned. Um, I get the health side of it, absolutely. Um, but, you know, where is the trade-off, particularly as we're not seeing too many details about the privacy aspect of it. Mm. There was a different view from Richard Wilson. I don't know if you're there, Richard. Yes, I am. Hi. Um, I share the um, concerns that the other people have um, mentioned about what the government is likely to do. But um, I think if it's, if there are some limitations which weren't anticipated in your survey, such as it's not tracking location for a start. Yeah. And if it's only for use in the medical crisis and then wound back, I think um, that at least the government would have a high chance of gaining more trust and you see that in your report that the, the trust there's a, they've got a dividend there or some capital mm. they could use and my comment was at the end of the day if you think that's getting out of control you can just delete the damn thing anyway. Mm. I, guess, I guess one of my broader concerns is if you look at you know where we are today with technology a lot of it traces back to 9-11 and the government taking measures to monitor the use of um, the internet and tracking sites people had gone to in the name of anti-terrorism. And that sort of then became adapted to a full industry of what Shoshana Zuboff now called surveillance capitalism. Um, so one of my concerns is that 
it's very hard to unlearn technology. And I'd just love us to be thinking through what are the guardrails we need to put around this technology before we just give it the two thumbs up. Um, but it's it's not a black and white issue. And, and I, I, what I do see happening at the moment, I think the government, again, it's not business as usual. So they are going to be very responsive to concerns and they do require a degree of social license for the thing to work, which actually opens up a conversation for everyone about what will it take for you to trust this technology. And as long as people think this through clearly and talk about that it needs to be deleted, it can't be commercially exploited, then, then you look at the other side on the, you know, the cost benefit of having people moving around the community again. But it is, it's, it's a really challenging, wicked problem. Catherine? Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. It is a challenging problem. Uh, and we do, as you say, as everyone, uh, well, you say, Peter, that we do need to be attentive to uh, the terms of engagement. You know, the government is needing to surveil the population to manage a crisis. Um, and, uh, and the surveillance relates to public health imperatives. It's not just gratuitous interest. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's making sure that there are reliable records uh, when these contact tracing um, exercises begin. And, and it, it's, not, it's not a black and white issue. It's not just that the government can never be trusted, therefore we shouldn't countenance this conversation uh, because uh, there are a number of interests that, that, are, that are attempting to be managed at this point in time. And uh, the efficiency of Australia's contact tracing operations uh, you know, has saved lives. And uh, and will continue to save lives. So, and the and I think I said a moment ago that, that this is happening manually now. This is this the government is collecting this data now. If you are infected, you you have to do a contact tracing interview so people can work out who you've come into contact with. It's not like they're connect uh, collecting a whole bunch of information that they're currently not connect collecting. They're just collecting it via a different mechanism. Now we need to be highly attentive to that mechanism and even more attentive to the fact that if this is to be rolled out for the population that that it's sunsetted that it that it has a limited life and then that's the end of it and then people can obviously it won't be mandatory the government as far as i know is is not contemplating making it mandatory people can exercise their own judgments about whether or not they download you know this information or, or this this app or not um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, look, it's complicated. And our responses to it in the survey, Peter, are complicated. People are all over the shop about it. We yeah. don't like it. We think it might be necessary. We're suspicious of the government. Um, you know, we don't want this level of intrusion, but it might be necessary. Mm. You know, that's, that, that sort of writ large in the survey is what, you know, the, the, mm. the, how people will be running these trade-offs through their, through their own minds. And, you know, I think there's, you know, some specific legislative protections for instance at the moment any any carrier of data can um has to open it up to national security um you know your your colleagues have borne the brunt of some of those yep. intrusive powers absolutely will this be exempt from that or will this be subject to those laws yeah well look i don't know and see i'm out of daily reporting at the moment so mm. i'm not across the yeah the latest as to how you know where the exemptions are and what the applicability of it is i certainly wouldn't give it blanket endorsement uh but you know obviously it's uh, i understand why they're contemplating using the tool i understand that hmm. um i'll dive back in for a couple more slides before we have a general discussion um I've just been texted that the Prime Minister has been competing with us for airtime yet again um, and has just announced that they're easing the restrictions to the extent that they are going to allow um, elective surgery, which speaks to some broader questions. Actually, that's another slide that I'll come back to. So the easing of restrictions, um, We've got a majority of people, and it's been in the chat a bit earlier. Um, I know Shannon and Leon had sort of made some comments in the chat. 49% um, say it's too early to consider easing restrictions. 9% are kind of in that, let's do it as soon as possible. The rest are in the range of one to two months. Um, yeah. It feels like 
there's a bit of a backlash to the rush to end all this. Um, and I think it is a risk for the government to go too fast. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously a lot of their traditional right-wing base pushing that. And it's, you can see that happening globally as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's genuinely a difficult um, set of circumstances for the government to manage politically. Um, the, the survey uh, results indicate that Australians aren't mugs. Uh, they know that, uh, you know, I've seen, oh, I don't know, I've seen pa parachute metaphors around, you know, it's sort of like, oh, well, the parachute's been deployed to arrest our fall. You're, you're about halfway away from the earth. Let's take the parachute off now. I mean, it's obviously ridiculous. Um, so people uh, have a, you know, a, a reasonable level of tolerance with the restrictions. They know what they're for, they can see that they're working. And it was interesting to me, Peter, that the, even the people who favoured loosening the restrictions, the sort of timeframes, as you said a second ago, were one to two months, right? Yeah. Not, not in five minutes, like down the track, let's think yeah. about doing this. But as you say, um, Peter, the government is under a lot of pressure from, uh, business interests who are, you know, obviously want to get back to their normal economic activity. There's some ideological kind of uh, arguments and we discussed that a bit last week, you know, let's, um, you know, why are we all suffering? You know, let's push granny out there. Why do, you know, granny's moments come, you know, she needs to take one for the team. Well, some of that sort of commentary is kind of, uh, was creeping in over the last week or so. So um, it is, difficult for the government they've got um they've they've basically if we if we pull back slightly and quickly you know the government has kind of shape-shifted its entire political identity in public view it's uh it's unleashed sort of massive um fiscal stimulus number of center-left policies um you know the, the a number of the stakeholders that would support mm. the coalition are tolerating that are tolerating that shape shift are not hanging out of the trees saying that this is terrible. What on earth are you doing? You've lost your mind. Um, everybody is sort of, there's a gritted teeth kind of silence or acceptance around that. Where the sort of breakout is starting to happen is along the kind of, you know, the freedom curve. Um, yeah. You know, people saying, well, hang on, um, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't live in a police state. We sh this shouldn't, these, these conditions shouldn't persist um, either because they've got, a much higher higher tolerance for death rates than I would have, or, be, you know, because hashtag freedom, you know, uh, there's always casualties in the freedom war, right? Um, and but that is that is genuinely difficult for the government to manage, and it's not only their fellow travellers. Obviously, the prime minister has a very, you know, acute sense, I think, of the tolerance of Australians too in these, um, in these conditions. He, you know, he, the premiers basically pushed the government into locking down more quickly than the government wanted to lock down. Um, Morrison is, you know, I know, uh, it wonders, you know, how, how long people will be compliant with, with a lockdown. I noticed myself, I don't know if others on the chat this week noticed uh, that I went, cause I walk every day. You know, I went for several walks last weekend. There was hardly anyone around. This past weekend, this one just gone, there was way mm. more people around than there were than there was the previous week, right? Which suggests to me, people think, oh, we've got this a bit licked. I can take a few more risks. Let's get out in the sun. The thing I really noticed this weekend was how many older people were around mm. compared to the weekend before. So the Prime Minister is also battling not only the fellow traveller problem, but how long is a piece of string for the population? How long will people comply with these social distancing restrictions? And they are genuinely difficult calls for leaders, premiers, prime ministers to make. Although the interesting thing on this second slide, the natural older demographic are the ones that are more likely to be saying, hold your horses. Yeah. Um, you know, 73% 60s and over want it at least the end of May. Yes. Well, um, which, which kind of makes sense, obviously, given they're at the, the at-risk cohort. But I thought, maybe I got my notes wrong, Peter, but I thought there was a bit of an uptick in the younger cohorts um, uh, over the last couple of weeks, understanding that this is a serious issue, though, too, that there's been a bit of rebalancing. But anyway, maybe there's some more fine-grained stuff that makes a yeah. lie out of my notes. No, I think you're right. It's just one that I didn't think I'd subject the group to today. Um, 
the, the, the partisan one, there's, there's not huge differences, but there is kind of coalition voters within the month. If you add all that up, it's kind of more than the others significantly. Um, that's getting up towards 30% um, who want things moving again. And that's always been the coalition's problem. They've got different constituents on a lot of their big issues, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the age thing, I just have one more slide that I thought was interesting, which it's kind of, as we are joking before, and John might help us here in a sec, it's a bit like um, an episode of The Wire. Well, it's, but well, um, it's, it's noodle isn't it? <laughs> but we basically asked people regularly what they're most concerned about. Um, and, and the areas where people are very concerned, you can see if you go across the different things people are concerned about from um, different ages. So um, for younger people, unemployment, well, unemployment across the board is now becoming, and the economy are the top two for most. Um, younger people have mental health in their mix, whereas older people have super in their mix. But what you can see is that the actual health itself issue is moving down the areas of concern and the economy is coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which again sort of, well, sort of correlates with other findings in the survey, this sort of the general disposition in the survey among people is that uh, the measures are working, they're, they're slightly less worried about being exposed to, uh, to getting ill than they have been at the beginning of the, you know, when we started asking these questions. So they're a bit more sanguine about the health risks because they think that the that institutions are managing the health risks reasonably well so unsurprising that people would then turn to their economic well-being which is you know even outside of a pandemic is always front and center isn't it i mean it's always mm. number one so mm. unsurprising that it would continue to be number one uh, and particularly in an environment where hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs so we've got about 10 minutes we've actually got to get our questions in for next week soon john are there any bright ideas coming through the chat um i saw gavin mcfadgen from acf had a question he'd put in the queue so why don't we call gavin up while you're going through and seeing what else is in there hi everyone can you hear me okay yeah hi great hi everyone gavin mcfadgen i run the climate and energy program at acf um thanks peter and catherine it's been really interesting my questions around um uh, I've never been part of so many discussions within the environment and civil society movement about working collaboratively. Never had so many conversations with the ACTU, with ACOS, with the broader civil society movement. And it's around whether we can kind of take this as an opportunity to not return to business as usual, to advance campaigns and outcomes for equality, for job security, and of course, for climate action. So my question is, what do you think the opportunity is there, particularly when we're, we're kind of not asking the community to return to business as usual, and they may be desperate to do that, but going, this is an opportunity to change uh, and make Australia better for people, for communities, and for climate action. So I'm interested in uh, what you think the opportunity is and what you think the public appetite might be for actually not returning to business as usual, but taking some opportunities to create a better, more equal, um, uh, country that also acts uh, on issues like climate change and so forth. Do you want to first crack, Catherine? Well, it's, it's sort of complicated, isn't it, Gav? I mean, uh, in the sense that part of the rebound in trust, um, if we sort of distill it right down for governments and institutions, is that voters awakening to this idea that, that governments and institutions care about them. They care about them sufficiently to try and get a public response, health response right, they care about them sufficiently to try and make sure their basic economic interests are served during the economic shock of this pandemic, right? And so people have, I think, that's my, that's my intuition, that people have responded to that, that they've, they have relearned that government cares about them. Whereas for the last 10 years, governments have appeared to care about nothing other than themselves and their intrigues. And that's a really powerful bond between people and the government. I've always thought, though, that the you know we've we've this has been an absolutely fascinating few weeks and months. Government's taken all kinds of really tough decisions over the last few weeks and months, but the really tough decisions are still in front of them. Um, the critical decisions that this government will take a, will come during the dismount. How 
how this support is unwound, how they how they sort of uh, regroup, recalibrate, redefine government on the other side of this crisis, whenever that happens to be. That's when the rubber hits the road. That's when it's possible that we will see, you know, a, a very unfulfilling return to politics as usual. Um, and also the government is going to be very, very preoccupied uh, for several years with economic recovery and with, with a, running a pro-growth strategy, which we're already seeing them talk about and we've seen Phil Lowe talk about and, and other, other policy makers. So, um, look, I'm, I'm not avoiding the question. It's just that I don't know the answer to it. I really don't know. I don't know what opportunity the government and uh, the opposition, I, I don't know what they'll do. I don't know how they will attempt to reassert themselves and redefine themselves. But uh, I think it's important for, um, for, for, the, for the community to also telegraph some expectations to government about you know, what they think government is the more benevolent, benevolent elements of government. You know, government makes lives better. Government can save planet from destruction. Well, government is a verb rather than, you know, a proper exactly. noun as well, exactly. yeah? Correct, exactly. So, uh, look, I, I don't know how that story ends. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Gavin, the other observation I'd make, and I'd also like to thank ACF. They're one of the partners of Australia at Home, and one of the things we're trying to do is be part of that collaboration and getting people to share ideas across across civil society is that a lot of the institutions that I've worked with over the last two decades, fantastic institutions, but they've all been very much focused on institutional strength, growth, raising money, pursuing mission. There's going to be a massive disruption across all these institutions as well. Um, there's just not going to be as much money around. We're already feeling it. I'm sure you guys are as well. I know Oxfam had significant staff cuts yesterday. Um, I think as we reimagine all these different groups in civil society, there is going to be a big, big disruption. And I think you're totally right to, to focus on the mission as we rethink what these organisations that sit outside formal government but very engaged in politics look like is going to be a critical bit of thinking that we're, we're going to have to get our heads around, yeah? Um, I saw there was a question from Peter Clark, and I want to call him up if he's still around. And Peter is an ex- ABC talkback guru who's been giving tremendous advice on how we can make these things work a little bit better. And I've been keen to call him up to stage at some point. It looks like you're there now, Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, Catherine. Yeah, I saw that article today about the young international student skateboarder who was fined, what, $1,600 by police. He pointed out that there were lots of people shopping in the nearby street near the park where he was picked up. Just the general thought that perhaps in New South Wales too, but certainly here in Victoria, are we seeing a sort of, I've used the term, reactionary overreach from the police? And putting that in the context of trust, which was a big part of the theme today. I think that's one for the report, John. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, and I just saw one coming through, which there's been a few of these, but Anthony Keenan, if he's, if Kayla can find him in the chat somewhere, just that kind of, um, which is a bit more of some questions around um, whether the future looks like one of deregulation or stronger institutions. Yeah, and I think, <clears throat> thanks Pete. Um, it will be inter interesting to see whether or not um, the trust uh, bump that we've seen across the public institutions, um, which I think obviously is fueled by a lot of anxiety and uncertainty that's out there in the community, whether or that's going to hold up when we start to see these, um, you know, um, uh, more, more um, emphasis from the government at least about trying to, you know, deregulate um, parts of the economy or, um, you know, strip away protections in terms of the environment, all, you know, in service of, uh, uh, you know, an unprecedented economic recovery that's necessary. Mm. I'd just say very quickly that there's, they're telegraphing the, uh, the growth agenda, which you've encapsulated in that comment. But don't forget, they're also telegraphing some sort of sovereign capability argument to mm. debate, which, uh, yeah, which, is quite, which is quite interesting uh, and has only been sort of um, 
uh, countenance at the top lines at the moment. We, we haven't penetrated down as to what that means. Um, but in a way, it's sort of, this is another curiosity about what you think happens on the dismount, right? At one, at one level, uh, big government, at another level, smaller government. So, and how that fits together and how, you know, how it coheres or doesn't, again, I think will be really interesting to watch over, you know, once the dismount happens. Mm. And the other elephant in the room, of course, is what happens to new start, job seeker, whatever you call it, um, after the six month period, does it go back to, you know, poverty line or do, is there a recognition that there's going to be more people that are going to need that sort of support? Mm, yeah, well, uh, TBC, TBC. Mm. Mm. Uh, one more question if we've got time. Is Sophia McGrain there? Uh, yes, hello. hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, no, I was just, um, well, yeah, you know, um, uh, to compare where we were this time last year when we were talking about, uh, you know, getting rid of the, uh, well, the Labor Party's um, election pitch was to cut back on the middle class welfare, like the franking credits and so on. And, it, you know, given the uh, election outcome, I think that, you know, I think it was pretty well split down the middle, um, people's reaction to that. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, yeah. whether, uh, you know, people's opinions on that have changed at all, you know, if they've shifted, or whether we can expect austerity measures to just mm. Well, the good news is that we've got a bunch of benchmarks we haven't used for 12 months. We've got attitudes towards getting rid of negative gearing, family trusts, ranking credits. It would be maybe timely and interesting to brush those ones off. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yeah, thank you Welcome. very much. Um, I think we're almost at the limit. Any last sort of reflections or anything you'd like, John, to put in the report this week, Catherine, given that you're going to be approaching deadline? Oh, God. Um, yes. Uh, oh, well, there's been some pretty good ideas, I think, thrown up in the mix. Um, I haven't got anything uh, specific beyond that. I think the testing, the sort of comfort of um, policing of the health regulations is a good thing to, um, to check, I think. Yeah, and the dismount questions as well, dismount, I reckon. Like, yeah. I, I, I still feel it's too early to talk dismount, but, you know. Well, it's sort of hard. It's, it's really difficult to project yourself into a, into a space where you can be coherent about what might likely happen. But, uh, but it'd be interesting to test some sort of general tolerances. Um, mm. I think that that would be worth, that would be definitely worth doing. And also the sovereign capability arguments, which I would think would be quite popular out mm. in the community as well. Great. You reckon you've got enough to work with, John? Yeah, I think that'll keep me busy. Good on you. <laughs> hey, um, thanks everyone for joining us again. We are committed to keeping this going through this national staycation. Um, so please be with us again next Tuesday, Catherine, um, when you'll almost be finished your work. Um, oh, goodness. Ha -ha. Yes. Tomorrow we've got a fantastic session, Emma Dawson from Per Capita with Jim Chalmers. So a lot of those broader economic questions I reckon will be under the, um, the microscope tomorrow. So you can register for that. Um, Thursday, we've got a couple of academics from QUT in Queensland have been doing some fascinating research on what they call automated disinformation. So digging right into the way that the crackpot theories about the virus are being spread around Twitter. So that's gonna be a really interesting discussion as well. So thanks again for everyone for coming. Until then, stay home, stay safe and stay connected and um, yeah, we'll see you again soon. Cheers.